those who are uh, joining us for the first time for this evening series, we are uh, talking on the fruit of the Spirit. The Lord has been ministering to us in the morning services just about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit, his role in our lives. And in the evening, we have been looking at the fruit. Many needs to be freed from himself, that is man, needs to be freed from himself and the tyranny of his sinful nature. The legalists thought they had the answer to the problem by providing laws and threats. I mean, this afternoon over lunch time, my wife and my cousin were just discussing about the laws that human beings are trying to really put in place in order to suppress evil. But Paul has explained in Galatians that no amount of legislation can change man's basic sinful nature. It is not the law from the outside, but love from within that makes the difference. We need that power within and that power that comes from the Holy Spirit of God nowhere else. And that's why again this morning we were reminded of this. Even in those times when we feel we are not able to really withstand those who hate us, the Spirit of God enables, there is power within that enables us to do extraordinary. Studying through the book of Galatians, I think even the youth in the church are using, uh, doing this in their series. There are about 14 references to the Holy Spirit in this book. In chapter 3, verse 2, as we noted last Sunday, it tells us when we believed in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came and indwelled us. It was confirmed once again this morning. In chapter 4, verse 6, it is the Holy Spirit in the heart who gives assurance of salvation. And the same Spirit who enables us to live for Christ and for his glory. Not in our own strength, not in our own might, but the Spirit of God who lives in us. This very Spirit, as we have again noted, is not simply a divine influence. He is a divine person. Just as are the Father and the Son, what God the Father planned for you and God, God the Son purchased for you on the cross, God the Spirit personalizes for you and applies that to your life as you yield control to this Spirit. When you study the book of Galatians, of course, in the last section, uh, Paul is actually explaining three ministries of the Holy Spirit that enable the believer to enjoy his liberty in Christ. The first ministry the Spirit gives in this book of Galatians, as Paul brings it to us, is that the Spirit enables us to fulfill the law of love, as you can see in chapter 5, verse 13 to 15, where the apostle writes, for you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Not only that, this very spirit enables us to overcome the flesh. And so just looking, first of all, 
the spirit within, within us giving us love that we need. He's poured his love in us so, so that we may be able to really extend that love to one another. And unless the spirit of God is permitted to fill us with this love, selfishness, competitions will reign even in a community like this. And so the Spirit also enables us to overcome the flesh, and that's what we see in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So again, Paul reminding the um, Galatians believers, being led of the Spirit and walking in the Spirit are the opposite of yielding to the desires of the flesh, as we noted that earlier in verse 19 to verse 21. And then lastly, the Spirit enables us to produce fruit. And that's what we've been looking at in verse 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So here again, the characteristics that God wants in our lives as believers, as we live together, and especially in the church of Christ, are seen in the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. And we have so far covered the four aspects of the fruit of the Spirit in the last sessions. Last Sunday, we looked at the patience where we were also just challenged to realize that God is patient, and as his children, we are to reflect that. So tonight, we'll continue with this series as we focus on kindness as one of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Just like patience, kindness is a characteristic of God intended to be produced by the Spirit in God's people like us seated here tonight. So that is what God will want also to see us reflect in our very life, kindness. So the question is, because what we've been doing, we've been trying to define this. What is biblical kindness? And note that, biblical kindness. Maybe it is again wise to tell you what it is not. It is not being nice. Because sometimes when we hear of the white kind, we think of just, okay, I want just to be, it's being a nice somebody. So what is the difference between kindness and just being nice? The dictionary defines this. It says, nice, defines nice as being agreeable. Being agreeable. Now, what does that imply? That implies that it is tolerant to the point that enables the other person to continue in some sinful or unhealthy behavior. This is what comes with this. Okay. Being nice, as noted here in the definition, implies um, that it's just to be tolerant and kind to other people, even though they are continuing in their sinfulness or unhealthy behavior. Genuine kindness does not do that because it is concerned with the total well-being of the other person. So what is really kindness, biblical kindness? The Greek word here that Paul uses is Christotes. That is a Greek word that Paul uses in this book of Galatians, to help us understand this. This word conveys the concept of something that is useful, helpful, or beneficial. And in both Old and New Testament, kindness consists of two components. And get this, the first is an inner disposition of compassion or mercy that results in outward act that is meant to benefit the other person. So that is what this word carries, an inner disposition of compassion and mercy that results in an outward act that is 
meant to benefit the other person, someone else. This very word emphasizes the outward manifestation in our attitudes, in our actions, and in our words towards people around us or other people. The attitude will work itself out in a sensitive awareness to seek out that which is helpful and uh, able to serve other people with. So you are actually sensitive to see how faithful or how careful can I actually serve those around me. And especially when we are addressing, addressing this topic, we are looking at the church of Christ as believers. If the Holy Spirit lives and operates within us, he will sweeten our disposition so that we may be kind towards others for the sake of Christ. Because he indwells us, and so he will produce that um, uh, disposition in us. Just as the Lord is kind, his servants are also commanded to be kind and not to be quarrelsome, but to be kind to all, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And just as does with all other manifestations of his divine fruit, the Holy Spirit gives God's children kindness. That is what we see in this very uh, book we have just read. So the Holy Spirit gives freedom from bitterness. Then he establishes us in the law of kindness. The Holy Spirit gives us a desire to be representative of the Savior, changing us from one glory to the other, thus becoming like our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the reason why this fruit, uh, fruit of the Spirit is given, or this aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is given to us, to form us into the Christ-likeness. So what is the law of kindness? It is to treat one another with the kindness of the Lord for the Lord's sake as God himself has treated us. And surely if the Lord was to treat us with all harshness, I don't know where we will be today. So having just now laid that foundation to understand what biblical kindness is, I think it will be also important for us to understand why is this aspect, the fruit of this Holy Spirit, necessary in the church of Christ today? Why is the Spirit of God giving to us this fruit? Why does he really want us to display this fruit in the life of our church, CBC, here? One, I think it's because though this aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is very common, we easily misunderstand it. Many know it as a virtue flowing from own behavior modification. And so some people will think, okay, look here, I'm already having this, so they think it is something I do or I produce out of my own doing. And we'll see the Bible will be correcting that. It is not in your own strength. Even in some cultures, as we are seated here, there are many of our cultures, they actually uphold this as a, a value in their own cultures, and they think, okay, that is actually something good, which is fine, but we need to realize that is not what the Holy Spirit probably has provided in that very culture. You may be holding on what will be called kindness, but it, not, it may not be kindness in the light of God. Not only that, some consider it to be inborn disposition. Now, when you consider people who have been born up as, okay, so-and-so is a kind person, you are actually saying to yourself, I can't be kind, okay, because I'm not born a kind person. And so that is why, again, we need just to correct that. We will not give an excuse to say, I'm not a kind person. I was not born that way. Not only that, some equate kindness with the acts of helping others with material goods. Just because you've been giving out some material goods, supporting others, and so on, the temptation is you might think you're a very kind person and therefore deserve acceptance before, before the Lord. 
But I just also want to let you know that there are many people who are doing many good things out there, but they are so much disconnected from Christ. They are so far from God, and yet they do those things that would be considered kindness. The church, the other reason why this topic is important, why we need this particular fruit in our lives is because the church has many needy people. Many needy people. We have also many poor people in the church. We have those weak people also in the church, weak physically, emotionally, and spiritually in our church CBC here. And that's why this aspect of the fruit is very necessary for us as a church. Just thinking of our dear sister Lynn, we need more of Lynn Smith in the church. For those who are here, if you heard the, the testimonies that were read, just to see she was acquired someone in the church, would not even notice her, but her kindness touched many lives in this church. The church needs this aspect of the fruit because we all need an act of kindness as well. As I just mentioned, okay, next coming to help me. You know, we need people to come and help one another in the body. I feel I need it. Someone show me some kindness. Not only that, God wants to display his kindness through us. He wants to do that through us. Since the Spirit is shaping us into Christ-likeness, we are to display these qualities that are displayed in the book of Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. When we are talking of the fruit of the Spirit, it's actually reflecting the very character of our Savior. And as God's children and Jesus being our brother, we want to emulate him in our walk. That's why I bring us to our last question. What does the Bible say to us about kindness? What does the Bible reveal to us? In the New Testament, kindness is most frequently used to describe God and the ways he deals with his people when you read in the New Testament. So let us look at several passages of scriptures here to see what we can learn from these very passages of scripture about God's kindness so that we may emulate him and display the very kindness that God has shown to us to the, uh, uh, among ourselves as believers. So I'll be reading some verses from here and there. This is a topical type of preaching, and therefore I will take you to a number of passages of Scripture. Let us quickly turn to the book of Romans, chapter 2, to see our first Scripture reference. Romans, chapter 2, I will read, read verse 4. Paul is writing, and this is what he says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? The Jewish brothers had been thinking they were so right with God, chosen nation, and the Gentiles were just people out there. And now Paul is reminding them here that look here, God is kind. He's been very patient with you. Requiring that out of his kindness that he's showing to you to draw you to himself and get to benefit of his grace. Here we see that God's kindness is ex 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 exhibited in his forbearance and patience with us for the purpose of leading us to repentance. That's how he displays his patience. His grace and kindness has brought us to repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the words that Paul said to the Jewish brothers, but more so it is also coming to us as Gentiles that out of his very kindness, he has brought to us repentance and faith in Christ. 
God is forbearing and kind toward sinners in, in wooing them to salvation. That's what he's doing. This demonstrates how all the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit are interrelated. And we see in this uh, section, we see that he is talking about God who is patient, as we saw last, last Sunday, and now God who is kind. All of that are interrelated as he reaches out to us. So here God is displaying his kindness to us as his people so that we may benefit in his gift of salvation that comes to us through repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, let us look in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. From verse 7, let's six, uh, 4 to 7, I'll read 4 to 7. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then verse 7 so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Once again, we see that God's kindness is inseparable from his mercy and grace. God didn't wait for us to respond positively to him before he extended his kindness to us. He just did it. Giving us, showing us his kindness through his mercy and grace. For the interest of time, I'll just read some more verses here again just to, to rush through without explaining the details of this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. We see in this section of scripture, it is a command here, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Here again, God's kindness is demonstrated by his forgiveness that he has made possible through his son, Jesus Christ. That is how he demonstrates his kindness. We have been forgiven by him through his son, Jesus Christ. We have been liberated by him through his son, Jesus Christ. That is how God has displayed his kindness to us. And as we have seen consistently in these passages, God's kindness is extended without regard of how man might choose to respond to that kindness. He just does it. He does it. And then the last passage of scripture I would like us to look at before we just draw out some principles. It is Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, if you can turn with me to Titus chapter 3, again verse 4 to 7. Paul writing to Titus and reminding Titus to let everyone to submit to the rulers here. And then he goes to verse 4, says, But when the goodness and the loving kindness, okay, look, just see that. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not this. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Again, here we see the connection between God's kindness and his mercy. God did not save us because of anything we did. 
we did not deserve it. He did not save us because we deserved to be saved by him. But rather, his salvation flows from his kindness toward us, which is not dependent on how, again, we respond. So that is how the scripture displays to us God's kindness. And as we are seated here, if we have experienced salvation, of course, you have experienced God's kindness to you. You did not deserve it. He came to rescue you. He has given you new life out of his mercy, out of his kindness. He's brought you salvation. Now, based on what we've just now learned from these very verses about God's kindness, I think it is right now, um, right for us now to start looking at what are principles we can draw from that so that we may start now demonstrating this very kindness to one another in the church of Christ. So that we may demonstrate the same type of kindness within CBC here as we treat one another, as we reach out to one another. So how may we develop kindness in the way we treat each other? Just some principles here. One, act without expecting anything in return. Act without expecting anything in return. That's what the scripture has actually demonstrated to us already in the manner God has extended his kindness to us. True kindness always acts without any expectation of receiving something in return. We certainly see this demonstrated in the very life of our Lord Jesus Christ also when he was on this earth. Jesus' kindness is the believer's example that we can emulate. For example, in the book of Matthew chapter 19, when children were being brought to Jesus Christ, coming to Jesus, the disciples were pushing them aside. And Jesus comes out and say, let the little one come to me. Not only that, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, that's where Jesus Christ is inviting. Come unto me, all of you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Learn from me, for I am gentle of spirit. And so that Jesus Christ opening up his hands to welcome, to receive without an expectation in return. Unfortunately, we have a tendency to be kind to, to others based on what they are going to give us in return. And that's where we fail as believers. And we often do that in ways that sometimes we don't even realize. We just do. Sometimes we fail to engage in acts of kindness because other person is, has nothing or is not in a position to do something back or pay us back. And so the Lord is telling us we need to be doing something without necessarily expecting someone must. So we withdraw what we are supposed to be doing as Christians. We need to realize the Lord has given us this particular fruit to use it in our lives as we minister to one another in his church. This is especially true when we are dealing with with those people, and especially sometimes we pull away when we think, okay, so-and-so is so needy, I don't want even to associate with. So-and-so is so poor, is not in my class. So-and-so is so weak spiritually, I don't want even to associate with. Or even the weak people in the church, the old people, we think, let the old be. No one want to show any concern. All the people are even struggling emotionally or even spiritually. We tend to think, ah, we are so special, I can't just associate because they have nothing to give me in return. We might think, okay, they are going to be draining me. I'd just rather stay away. You see, that is the temptation all of us find ourselves in. And that's why as the church, we need to be a safe place where hurting people can come 
just as they are and receive our kindness without ever feeling we are expecting something in return from them. Let us be that kind of a church. Even when people come here for the first Sunday, don't just think, okay, there is a simulation group. I have nothing to do with that. Let us extend our kindness to people. Let us identify those that are hurting in the church and get to minister to them and not say, I don't want my comfort to be affected. The Spirit gives us this to use to serve the church of Christ. Number two, the second principle that we can learn from what God has revealed to us, it is to exhibit kindness whether or not it is deserved. That's what God has done to us. Exhibit kindness whether or not it is deserved. It deserved. Again, we see this aspect of kindness is demonstrated in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus never waited until someone did something to deserve his kindness before he acted. And one of the passages that is so great here is Romans chapter, chapter 5, verse 8. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not only that. We want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 6 and just to see what Jesus is doing in this passage of scripture here. Luke chapter 6 from verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloaks, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that, that others will do to you, do so to them. Verse 32. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit that, that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your word will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind, get that. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. That is God. That is Christ. And I think even as Pastor Charlie mentioned this morning on hatred, it's not always very easy to love those people who hate you. And that's what, why we are saying it is only through the help of the Holy Spirit we can do such. It is very difficult to show kindness to your enemies. And it's only through the Holy Spirit we can manage this. God is even kind to the ungrateful and the evil. In other words, his kindness is manifest even to those who don't deserve. He does that in order to lead them to repentance. That's what he does. And then lastly, give and receive kindness with grace. Give and receive kindness with grace. We need to realize kindness is two ways traffic. And we have learned to accept kindness of others as well as we offer it to them, okay? We need to receive kindness from others and give it back to them. Many times it is often harder for us to receive kindness from other people. Sometimes it is there wanting to be given to us, people showing kindness, and then we become suspicious or we pull them aside. We show them, I actually don't need your help. Sometimes we may be even struggling spiritually and someone is coming to offer you help spiritually and you say, out of my life. People, God wants us to minister to one another. God wants us to be a blessing to one another. God wants us to be kind to one another. And Jesus actually demonstrated this um, in, the, in John chapter 12, verse 7 to 8. I will not go there. Where this woman comes and she's, she's actually um, uh, applying oil to Jesus Christ, anointing his feet and wiping her feet with her hair. 
And the Judas comes and says, look here, this oil that is being wasted will have sold it for good money to help the needy. But the, his motive was not actually right. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, leave her alone. Jesus is accepting that service. And that is the kind of attitude we also need to display when kindness is being extended to us. We accept it that way, serving one another. And so, as I conclude here, Paul, in his letters, has appealed to Christians to be kind to one another and clothe themselves with kindness. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, we read that scripture last Sunday. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And then in Ephesians, we read that verse already, us as believers are actually commanded to exercise this. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as in Christ God forgave you. As Christians, we must be marked by the lives of kindness expressed through the acts of serving one another, extending generosity to one another, extending hospitality to one another. That is how we can use this aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, kindness. Okay, we'll now just take this time to go and engage in praying. And as we pray, I just want to request us, think of those people in this church who are struggling that need you to show them kindness. We have all the people in the church with a lot of physical problems. How can we best serve them? How can we best serve one another in this particular church that God has given to us? The Lord is feeding us so well. How can we be more practical in our Christian living? It is why this fruit of the Spirit is given. And that's why I just want us, as we pray, to think in that very light, praying for one another and praying that the Lord will also give us the courage to say, yes, Lord, help me with this fruit so that I can get out and minister to others effectively. Okay, thanks. Let's engage.